Greetings everyone, this is Eric Andelin, Senior Workflow Specialist with SimActive, and you're here for our webinar, Minimizing Costs of Drone Mapping Projects. And I'd like to introduce Robert Thompson, Geomatics Technologist at Meridian Surveys. Robert, say hi. Hello, everyone. Great, thanks. Um, so Robert, um, give us a little bit of your background, your company, and, and what you guys are doing. Um, my background, uh, mostly uh, traditional surveying and mapping. Uh, do a little bit of UAV processing and deliverables on the side. Um, our company, Meridian Surveys, we're located in uh, Saskatoon, Canada. We have several branch offices throughout Western Canada. Um, we're kind of focused on uh, pipelines, oil and gas, civil construction, municipal and legal surveys. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, tell me this. So you guys are involved in, in using drones, maybe even aircraft as well? Uh, mostly drones. Mostly yeah. drones. Okay. And um, so with these drones, uh, mostly uh, fixed wing, multi-rotor? If, if you want to tell uh, me what systems you use, that's great. I think our main workhorse would be uh, DJI Phantom 4. Okay. Um, that's That's been kind of our main mainstay for a while. Uh, within the past year, uh, we purchased a uh, yellow scan map or LiDAR system. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mounted on a DJI M300 RTK unit. Okay. Okay. So those are, those are kind of our two, two main systems. And then, um, um, are your projects again, when you're, when you're using, um, the drones for acquisition, are they, uh, land development pipeline work? What, I mean, what typically do you guys do? Yeah, um, kind of a little bit of everything. Um, land development, pipeline work, uh, volume tracking, yep. uh, prelim prelim surveys uh, for engineering construction, um, whatever whatever's out there. I mean, there's lots of different applications for yeah. for drone work. So, and I, I'm sh you guys, I, I'm sure have your own survey crews. You have your own engineering department. You guys do way more than just this. Is that correct? Uh yeah, yeah. This is kind of a little bit on the side. But, so, um, so drones are a, a tool in the toolbox. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, you, like I said, you just got involved in LiDAR or, well, you got involved in drone-based LiDAR um, with yeah. the DJI system. So um, that must that must be opening up things for you guys and, and also making things a little bit easier. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and then... In your position, um, what do you do on with, with the drones? I mean, you do everything from project setup. Uh, primarily, I, I get involved after uh, project setup acquisition. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of more involved uh, in the, the office side of things, post processing and okay. uh, deliverables, making topographic maps, okay. uh, producing kind of the final. Um, clean deliverable for the client. So the project will come to you already flown. You've got, you, you've got uh, a, a boundary file or something like that where, you know, they, they say, Hey, you know, this is what we need X yep. deliverable out of and off to the races. Yep. Yep. And the, um, with the, with the, the phantom, uh, did you say that was RTK or no? Non RTK, no. Non RTK. We just uh, we we fly with uh, GCPs and and ground checks. Yep. Okay. So we're, so, we're pretty good. So, uh, yeah. So you've got survey crews involved in what you're doing, and many yep. times, you know, on those projects. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Um, cool. So, and I know you guys also, um, you know, as a tool in your toolbox on the software side, you have Correlated 3D. You guys work with with our software. Um, yeah. So um, that's great. And and for our users, they understand or our listeners understand that um, Correlated 3D doesn't do everything. Correlated 3D does um, image-based processing and it works with LiDAR data. At some point, 
you're going to take the data from Correlated 3D into another software um, mm -hmm. to maybe extract deliverables that might be ESRI or QGIS or whatever you have to be working with or MicroStation yeah. or something like that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in this in this webinar, we're kind of talking about you know the typical layout of a project from start to finish, um, how you go about things, and I, I always need to let everybody know that what we're going to cover is is typical drone mapping project costs, um, cost variations as projects become larger, then um, workflows in Correlated 3D to minimize your man hours, and then finally the possibility of using multiple PCs to accelerate processing. So um, we'll cover all those topics. And let's start with typical drone mapping project costs. And every company can be different in how they do this, but you know, let's let's just consider what is normally involved in this. And the steps involved usually, um, you know, you get your call from your customer or your client um, asking you to fly a specific area, whether that's you know again land development or you know, any kind of pipeline work, which is you know corridor type work. So they'll give you a boundary most likely. Um, someone will do the flight planning, um, depending on the size of your company. If you're, you know, if you're a one-man shop, you're doing it all. If you're, you know, a a arm of an engineering or a survey company, you may be doing portions of it. So, you know, flight planning, uh, mobilization. Uh, you know, again, depends on. Like you said, you guys have got offices throughout Canada, correct? Uh, Western Canada. Okay. So, do the uh, in in the event you have you know a project that's that's a decent distance away, are you going to is is are the drones going to be in different offices? Are they going to be sent to different offices, or how's that? Work? Uh, we usually try to keep uh, drones in each office, and then we'll mobilize out of those offices. Right. So you guys have kind of. Time standardized or created uh, drone crews within each office. They all know how to operate kind of the same way so that the, the product coming in is always the same. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So you've got your, your standard operation procedures, opera operating procedures, and, and they follow those. Um, so that, that goes to the question of mobilization. At some point, mobilization can get uh, unruly and if your project is eight hours away, if you or don't no. have a drone closer, you may subcontract that, you may find another way to do the project. What would you typically do? Uh, a lot of times uh, we'll just have to travel that distance. Yeah, and, and, and I, I would yeah. guess a lot of those places are pretty isolated. So, um, absolutely, you know, Maybe down here in the states, it's real easy to get an aircraft to go fly something for you if you need it done because there's, yeah. you know, hundreds of small mom and pop aerial mapping companies uh, up there. Um, Northern or, Canada. Yeah, it, it's pretty remote. Pretty remote. So, so your mobilization range is probably much higher than most folks um, as far as yeah. distance, but it's something to be considered. Um, you know, are you mobilizing out and then spending, you know, a week in the field and then coming back? Or are you a, you know, a company down here in the States where you may mobilize to the project site and then, and then demobilize every day? And, you know, it may mm. take you a week to get the project done, but you have to account for that in your project costs. <clears throat> and then the other thing you got to think of is, you know, how many missions you have to fly. So, uh, DJI Phantom Floor 4 flies for about what 20 30 minutes? 25, yeah. Yep. So, as the project gets larger, you've got to fly multiple missions or have multiple drones out there flying at the same time, which means multiple crews. Um, you know, there, there's, there's always a, a limit to how comfortable you are in your acquisition and how much you can do in a day. Uh, yeah. In the old days, you know, when we did aerial photography, uh, your window of acquisition was between 10 a.m. and 
2 or 3 p.m., depending on the sun angle. Uh, yeah. With drones, we've got a little bit more flexibility. Uh, they're, uh, they're lower. Um, you can mitigate some of the issues with cloud shadow and, and things like that, um, which you couldn't back in, in the large format days. So that's something to be aware of. Uh, you know, I'm, what do you think are some of the other challenges when you talk about going out to acquire a project? Um, a lot of times weather, yep. time constraints. Um, if it's kind of a long linear project, um, having multiple missions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I will say that here, I'm, I'm based in Florida. Um, we know that, you know, this time of year, as we move from the west to the east coast of Florida, at about one o'clock, the clouds start to pop and then your day is done because yeah. you're, you're just you're just not going to get anything done. So um, I, I would imagine you have something similar to that. Yeah, especially the, this time of year, there's there's not a lot of light in the day. Mm -hmm. So start later, end earlier. So mm -hmm. uh, what about are you starting to do um, dual collect with, say, the LIDAR unit and imagery? Yes, uh, we do have, uh, with the yellow scan mapper, we did purchase the camera modules. So we'll be able to collect both simultaneously, right. those processes. Yeah. So that can make things a little bit easier. And, and even, I, I guess, up where you're at, probably you're, you're dealing with uh, vegetation that, that is not uh, deciduous. It's not, the, the leaves don't fall typically. So you, you've yeah. got to have something to penetrate ground. Um, where, where the LiDAR, I'm sure, helps a lot. It, it varies in areas, but yeah, typically, um, yeah, it's deciduous. Yep, yep. Um, and then uh, the the other steps, uh, project setup, that's, that's basic. But, um, you know, again, when you're talking about using something like a Phantom, you, I don't know what probably, you're probably capturing about 40 acres, 50 acres per flight. I don't know what acres are in hectares, yeah, but not a big area. Yeah. Yeah. So a few hundred square meters. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if you've got a, a thousand square meter project, all of a sudden you've got a lot of flights um, to capture. So that, you know, that involves, you know, part of the, the flight planning. Um, you deal with that in mobilization, you deal with that in missions. Project setup, again, now we're talking about how do we bring all of those images into one place to, you know, to start working on your project. And uh, the yellow scan, does it have um, a separate EXIF file for the images or is it actually being captured in the camera? Um, there's another software that we use, uh, Postpack. Okay. That... Uh Yep. We used to get the trajectories sorted out and then we write the XF to the images. Right, which which would make sense because pause pack is, you know, that's pulling data from the IMU. So you're getting roll pitch and yaw, you're getting very accurate yep. positional information. And then you just sequence that up with the image capture times. That's and right. And that yep. gives you your EXIF file. So <clears throat> that's a step that people have to consider. Um, the next would be processing so you know you you have to determine how long it's going to take to process your data maybe how many workstations you have available uh, maybe your license is busy or you know the licenses you have of your software is currently busy so you have to you know feed that into the production chain um, uh -huh. you know to get work moving um, then editing uh, no matter what anybody says, you're probably going to want to edit your data. Um, yep. You know, it, I, I like to say massage it, make it look good. Um, you know, you could you could work on the image balance. You could work on your your seam lines, all kinds of things like that. And you know, the the interesting thing about drones is that you've got so many small images, so your AT takes longer because it's creating more tie points. Your um, editing can take longer because you have more seam lines. So these are all things that, you know, 
back in the large format world that, that still exists, um, you know, what you cover with a thousand images with a drone, you may cover with five images with a large format yep. aircraft. So, sure. you know, uh, obviously processing times are, are longer. Um, then obviously there's, there's the QA, QC portion. So once you've got it done and you say, I think we're good, we've got some good yep. data, then you've got to get other eyes on it. Um, just, yep. just like when you're in college and you're writing that paper, you get eventually numb to what you've written and you have to have someone else look at it and say, you know, am I coherent here? And I think it's the same way with, with imagery. Once, once you've processed it out and you've done your best at it, you, you tend to want somebody else to take a look at it and just give it an overview and say, yeah, everything looks good. Um, and then from there you can go about creating your deliverables, um, you know, and again, out of correlated 3D, you're getting you're getting imagery, you're getting a surface. Uh, you can generate contours. You can create um, uh, feature or, or line work if you want. Um, you've you've got those options, but in reality, this data is typically going into some kind of software like MicroStation or AutoCAD or something, where. Sure. The person using that is probably more comfortable creating contours in that software um, yep. and more confident in it. And that's what they're going to do. So yeah, a little bit more control. Yep. And they, they may pull in that, that nice raster surface that you created and decimate the heck out of it and make it just a yep. 10 point grid, <laughs> which is fine. I mean, that's, that's what they do. You also have now the, the LIDAR component of it. So um, when do you bring, if you bring that LIDAR into your processing workflow, whether it's in correlated 3D or after, um, you've got to make those considerations. But again, deliverables as far as correlated 3D ends with a surface, an image, and then possibly a point cloud uh, for some people, a model. And then, yep. you know, those are the things you have to consider. Those are the steps that are involved going from A to B in your drone project. Did I miss anything? No, I think it covered it well, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, then next let's talk about, um, you know, how we would estimate man hours. And, you know, uh, again, if you're, if, if you're a, a single operation shop, it, it's simple. It's you and, and what you want to charge to do the project. <laughs> Um, yeah. You know, it's you and what you want to charge versus your competition to keep working. So, uh, you know, that's that's pretty straightforward and easy. And, and you know, we've maybe uh, when a lot of us started out or got involved in drones, this is, this is where we started. Um, then, you know, maybe the next level up would be now you're working for a company, you know, so you're a paid employee and you have to generate X amount of value to the company to remain there and, yeah. um, and, and to, to feed the profit model that they're working off of. So now we're talking about skill levels uh, required in doing what we're doing. So, you know, you've got uh, maybe the, the drone operator who yeah. may be similar to a technician in, the, in, you know, in, in office, which is actually really good because if you don't know what you've acquired, what it looks like when somebody's processing it, then you don't necessarily know if you're collecting it properly. So uh, yeah. some some in-office time helps that person working in the field understand Absolutely. why they're capturing We, we, we yeah. try to do that. We try to train our crews on both, both yeah. ends. Yeah. yeah. Even at a minimum, if they just do a QC in the field, at least they can see yeah. what they're, what, what you want to see. Um, yeah. So, so you've got a, a field person, a, a technician, somebody in the office that's doing uh, what you're doing, actually churning through the data. Um, yep. Depending on where you're at, what state you're in, you may need professional licensure involved. So in the states, like in Florida, we have to have a licensed surveyor involved, even though they're not a photogrammetrist, they're a surveyor and they yep. sign off on everything. Companies have liability, you have to sign off on that kind of stuff. I would imagine you guys have similar. Yeah, at a very high level. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they 
they're going to dip their fingers into your project because they have to be billable too. So, uh, yeah. you know, they're going to look at your project and they're going to touch it and they're going to make sure that what you do meets the, the quality standards that the company, you know, mm-hmm. um, espouses. So you, you've got that. And then you also have um, field crews. So again, if you're a small company, you may, it may be, may, maybe it's just you. But if you're a larger company or if you're working on larger projects, you're going to need more than one person out there with the drone. You're going to have somebody flying it, somebody observing it, um, somebody existing, uh, assisting in takeoff and landing, um, you know, swapping out batteries, setting up the next project. Your field crew might also be a crew of surveyors. So while the drone's out there flying, somebody's out there with a rover picking up, you know, yep. uh, elevations. Pretty so, common, yep. You know, again, that's now you've got basically three levels of 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 charges to your project. You've got a technician, you've got field crews, and you've got a professional somewhere there involved. Um, yep. So those are all things to think of, and then. Um, each one of them has their own skill level and you also have to consider, you know, some of the, uh, ancillary costs like your mobilization, you know, it Mm -hmm. may only cost you may only take five hours to fly a project, but it may take you three hours to get there and three hours to get home. It may take you a week to get there and a week to get home. So, you know, those, those costs have got to come somewhere. So when you're, when you're setting up your project for someone, you've got to consider that, um, and we talked about it. the other things are, you know, how do you determine your cost? Well, obviously it's man hours um, plus the processing time and then maybe, you know, resource availability. So, you know, is that workstation available? Um, you know, can we complete the project in the amount of time that we, you know, estimated that we yeah. could do it? So you've got to consider those things. There's another thing called overhead, which again, if you're a little company, um, you don't have to deal with that. If you're a large company, you've got multipliers and overhead and, and all kinds of things to consider. So, you know, and that just goes to, I have an employee and I, I pay him X dollars, but on top of that, I have to pay for insurance. On top of that, I have to pay for, uh, the computer he works on and the survey vehicle that he drives. And as a whole yep. marketing, legal, all that as a whole, there's a multiplier to your base fee or your base yep. pay that you've got to consider. So again, mom and pop, not so much, but if you're a bigger company, that's what you got to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, can you think of anything else I missed there? No, I think you covered it great. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the next thing, which is cost variations um, as projects become larger. So, um, obviously, one complete project, uh, one complete mission is mm-hmm. the best way to go. You know, so, yep. it, you know, it, obviously, if, it, if it's small enough and you can capture it in one flight and you can process it all as one data set, that's where you're going to reach maximum efficiency. So you have to consider if that's the case, um, is the drone I'm flying appropriate for the majority of my work? Um, mm. or, or can I develop a workflow that minimizes the fact that I have to do this over multiple missions? So those are the, the two things to consider. Um, when you work with subsets, um, it does create inefficiencies only because you may have overlap that you're doing redundant processing of. Um, it may require you to put more control out, um, just to hold the whole project together. It may require you to, um, basically create three quarters of a project and then merge them all together into one. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar (laughs) with that. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and, and those can all create additional editing. So if, you know, just, for consideration, if you have, you know, a hundred images in one flight and you create seam lines of those hundred images and you correct all those and you have another flight right next to that and it's got overlap and you create seam lines of those, put all those together, 
Then you put those two back together. Now you've got another seam line that you're going to have to create. Yeah. You know, There's also a little bit of color balancing variations between the two data sets. Absolutely. And I, I'll make the comment that, you know, Correlator 3D, and I, I would assume all other software, um, when you complete one area, it's color balanced that one area. Yep. Um, if you then bring in another tile next to it and there's overlap, that one may have been color balanced too, but the radiometric balance or situation was captured. If this one was captured at 10 a.m. and this one was captured at, at 3 p.m., yep. you're just naturally going to have some color balance. So. Now you're going to do, which you may have to do in Photoshop or something else, um, you know, which just, you know, again, creates an extra step. So yep. while I'm talking about this, can you think of any situations where, um, you know, or, or additional steps that might be required because of something like that? And like I said, the one to me that sticks out is maybe survey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, adding, adding more control. Um, yeah, because when, when you have those, let's just say multiple flight lines where they have overlap, you really want control in that overlap. Yeah. Um, you know, so that, that, that can become a challenge. Yeah. We um, have learned that has uh, caused some issues in the past. So yeah. 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 Um, you got a little bit of an advantage though, cause you can use the LIDAR system. Um, and, and granted it still has to fly multiple missions and you still have to run pause pack on all those, but yeah. you can create a coherent surface from that LIDAR mission which you could then use to control the imagery. Yeah. So that that's that's a good that's a good at least in Correlator 3D we can do that. Uh, let me get into the next section. So, um, but again, all of those impact um, you know your project, your project timeline, how how much effort's going to be involved, how much man hours, so all those things. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about workflows in Correlator 3D to minimize man hours. And um, again, we'll, we'll show some examples here uh, later on. But one of the nice things is uh, unlimited images. So yeah. when in, uh, I know, big projects, what big projects have you done? Um, some of our larger ones, maybe 10, 15,000. Yeah, so that's... So, so not massive, but... Uh, we we definitely couldn't do it in other software. That's yeah. You'd know, have to split it up, and it'd be a lot, a lot more work. Yeah, a lot, a lot of repetitive steps. So, yeah, let me let me back up for a minute. So you're capturing imagery with the Phantom, and yes, you have to do multiple missions to get those fifteen thousand images, lots yeah. of them. But you can take all of those images and dump them into one project in Correlated three D, and yeah. you're good to go. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. yeah. So, um, in, in 10 to 15,000 images is, you know, it, that's, that's a pretty big project. Um, yeah. we just had a, and we'll talk about this in an uh, upcoming webinar, but we just had a client in, in Europe that did something on the range of 30 to 40,000 images. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it, incredible stuff. And it's all corridor work. So that's going to be neat to see. Um, how much do you guys work at all with the scripting functions? I've touched on it a little bit. I think the the majority of our projects are, are small enough where uh, we could rip through them fairly quickly. But uh, for the odd time where we've had you know ten fifteen thousand mm -hmm. image project, yeah, I would I would use it. Yep. Get the get the AT set up first, and then uh, do the scripting after. Right. Exactly. So you could you know you could do the AT and then turn around and script it to just go through each series of images and, and create the outputs that you want, um, yeah. which is, you know, that's, that's really nice. And, and for, even as the project's bigger and bigger and bigger, um, you could script it to work. Um, again, all the images come in together, but you could script it out into blocks where you mm. don't have to deal with, um, overlap, but you could say tile it such that when it comes time to do your break lines or not, sorry, uh, your seam lines, um, okay. one person may be working on one block 
and another person could be working on another block without interfering with each other and still working out of the same data set. So sure. that would be kind of a, a, a cool way to move through data faster. And then uh, bringing your LIDAR in um, as part of the project. So where have you guys, where are you guys in that um, iteration of your processing? Um, we'll usually create the DEM um, in the yellow scan cloud station software, mm -hmm. uh, get that all post-processed and then push that over to correlator, use the DEM uh, yep. for, to do the AT. Yeah, because AT, I mean, AT still takes its time, but if you've got an existing DEM and it's a good yep. one, um, that's a big chunk of processing time in correlated 3D. And if you can eliminate that, um, you know, that's going to move things along faster for you. Yep. And, then, and even the DSM creation too. Yep. And, you know, let's, let's face it. I mean, um, LIDAR doesn't penetrate trees, um, but it finds lots of holes in them. <laughs> and uh, so your surface is um, a more, it, it's a more representative solution for the surface than image-based um, AT. Yep. So um, that's something to consider. And then um, in, in now in our software, if you wanted to, um, once you've created that point cloud in yellow scan and you've produced that, you could always just bring the point cloud to correlate a 3D it would immediately convert it over to a, a DEM and it would create a raster image as well. Yep. And the raster image comes from the intensity. Uh, the intensity comes uh, basically from the, the, the LIDAR. So the higher the quality, the LIDAR system, um, the better refined intensity, the more points you get closer to the ground, the more dense that intensity image is gonna be. And in a lot of cases, you can, again, use that to pick control points um, for, the, for the overall project for the, for the AT. So um, something like that is, is very valuable. And then the, the last thing I wanted to mention is our ability to use distributed processing. So... Yeah. Um, when you've got a big project, um, it really comes down to the amount of power you could, or the amount of crunch time um, yep. that your machines can do. Um, we are graphics card based um, and we create a very efficient uh, processing workflow as far as pushing the images through the bus to the graphics card um, mm -hmm. to, you know, to run all the steps. Um, are you guys working at all with distributed processing? Mm, not as of yet, but I mean, if we yep. begin to tackle on more 15, 20,000 image projects, yeah, I could see that being <laughs> I, pretty I can, valuable. I can only imagine, uh, you know, how fun that project was. Those, those first large projects were, uh, uh you know, <laughs> you get with somebody breathing down your neck saying, when's this going to get done? <laughs> A lot of, yeah, a lot of cursing and yeah. <laughs> we added a feature and I don't know if you're, uh, if, if you're familiar with it or not, but the, um, the email notifications. I have noticed that. Yeah. yeah. That's nice when you're not away. Yeah. You're not in front of the computer. Yeah. yeah. Because when you're crunching a project of that size, you know, you're going to walk away for a while. Um, you yeah. know, it might be a day, it might be a night, it might be three nights. Um, yeah. and it's sure nice to know. Um, when text gets, messages yeah. yeah when it gets done processing so um, definitely check that out and um, I've shown people how you can just have that email go straight to your text on your phone and then yeah, you just get it that's message. nice so <laughs> that's a that's a great um, uh, option as well so you know um, as we talk about this and, and before I head out to um, you know go on more detail about the project cost setup and things like that um, do you have uh, any other comments on some of the projects you've done or, or thoughts on, you know, where we should go with Correlator 3D as we're moving forward? Um, I think for me, you know, I really see the value of taking on a large volume of projects. It might not be 15, 20,000, but 
yeah. smaller, but you might have 10 of them a day or something mm -hmm. like that. So being yeah. able to rip through those efficiently and when the client is breathing down your neck, it it's, it's really allowed me to do my job and um, uh, keep them happy. Very good. Um, I, I guess I, I didn't ask the question, but you mentioned that you guys do some volumes. Um, yep. you know, I would assume it's the same site um, or same sites. Um, it kind of varies depending on the projects. Like some some projects, yeah, we'll be revisiting the same site, and then others it'll be kind of along the the long linear corridor. So in in different areas. So. Mm -hmm. The, I, I was going to mention that that is a great place to use scripting um, yeah. to you know basically duplicate duplicate the workflow that you did the previous time. Um, we'll save that you time a lot. to create the boundaries for the yep. stockpiles. Yep. Yep. So um, something to consider. There's a you know, and I'll, I tell this to people all the time. There's a lot of things you can do in Correlate 3D that you don't think about. Um, yep. You know, like doing surface to surface comparison. So. Um, just before you you know create that volume report you can just look at this year's surface versus last year's surface and say hey as a as a sanity check does everything look right um before i go out and, and create the volumes and things like that so sure. um there's some neat tools in there so um with that i'd like i'd like to thank you for joining me um i'm going to go ahead and and jump off into the project costing um, side of this and then we're going to put up some slides and all kinds of things like that and I know you're a busy man so perfect uh, I, am. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're ready to get back to those projects but um, thanks again for your time we appreciate having you oh, uh, with us okay so let's talk about some of the typical drone mapping project costs so you would normally have uh, your flight planning your mobilization the missions that you would be flying uh, project setup in the office, processing, editing, QA and QC, and then creation of your deliverables. So estimating man hours. Again, if you're a small one-person shop, this is a piece of cake. But if you're an engineering survey firm, you've got some options as to who you want to um, put to those tasks. So we have our professionals. That would be in states where we need a licensed surveyor. That would be our surveyor. Uh, it could also be a, a certified photogrammetrist, depending on, again, where you're at. You have technicians, so somebody who is working in the office. You're going to need a two-man crew in most cases, two-man crew for the flying, probably a two-man crew to go out and do any survey if they're not the same person. Let's look at the different skill levels that we would apply to our tasks. Flight planning is probably going to be a professional. That's uh, either going to be your licensed surveyor, somebody responsible in charge, your photogrammetrist, somebody who knows how to do all the flight planning, make sure it's done right. Next would be mobilization. You're always going to have to mobilize to and from site, and that's typically you know the crew that's going to do the work, whether it's, again, just the flight crew or whether maybe they're doing both flight and survey. But it's going to be a two-man crew. Flying the mission, same thing, two-man crew. Project setup, so back in the office. That could be, again, a professional or a technician, uh, depending on how you want to uh, do things in, in, your, in your program. Processing is done by a technician. Editing is done by a technician usually. QAQC, again, this is when the technician comes and says, hey, I've got everything done. Do you want to check it? If it's not another technician, it's probably a professional doing this. And then finally, deliverables. Once you get the okay that everything's good, you're going to process out the deliverables and then have them sent off to the client. The important point to note there is that for each of those individuals, their pay rate's going to be different, their overhead rate's going to be different, so you have to account for those things. Some additional considerations. Average flight time of your drone. So obviously, if you're using a, a Phantom 4, the amount of coverage it's going to get in one mission is a lot less than, say, a Wingtra drone. You have to keep that in mind because you are limited by daylight hours or at least a portion of those daylight hours to get all your missions complete. You, if, if not, you're going to be mobilizing more than once to the same site. So things to consider. Uh, again, mobilization to and from. You want your projects and your 
you want your aircraft for your project to be um, efficient and be able to get the project done in as few mobilizations as possible. Uh, ferry time between flights. So you can't just say that, you know, my wing to drone fly will fly for 45 minutes and that means I can get 10 flights in a day. That's not necessarily true because it's going to come back. You're going to swap out batteries. You're probably going to pull the SD card. You're going to do things that take time in between flights. You're going to have to move to another location and so forth. So you have to consider ferry time. And then um, field QC. You don't want to leave the site. You don't even want to finish from one mission to the next without QCing the data, at least seeing that the coverage is there. Uh, finally, data transfer. So these are all things that factor into the amount of time you are working on this project. So how much imagery can your software handle? Can it handle one block? In this example, we've got um, you know, 1,400, almost 1,500 images in one block. However, if you have to use, if, if your software is limited in the number of images that it can ingest, then you're going to have to break the project up. And when you break the project up, you're going to have to have overlap between those project blocks. So overlap is extra imagery, which means you're going to be accounting for it in, say, tile one. You're going to be accounting for some of the same images in tile two, some of the same images in tile six and tile seven and so forth throughout the project. What does that do to your project? Well, it balloons it from 14,000, almost 15,000 images to almost 20,000 images. So you've just increased your processing, overall processing time, by a minimum of 20%. So something to consider. Look at you know a scenario where we're just processing one large block of imagery. So your flight planning is a half hour, your mobilization, you know, to and from the site, say it's uh, eight hours. You've got uh, 15 missions to fly. Uh, overall project setup is, you know, uh, a quarter of an hour. Processing, you know, overall, how much time it's going to take to process. So editing and processing are typically close to the same. Uh, QAQC is, is a percentage of that. And then, of course, creating your deliverables. So it is, in this scenario, your total project hours with one block, is about 46, 47 hours. If we do it with multiple blocks, now we start to see things change. Your flight planning is the same, your mobilization is the same, the missions are the same. Your project setup is probably the same or close to, it might be a little bit more. But when you start looking at the processing, the editing, the QAQC, and the deliverables, all of a sudden your hours are going up. And here, and here you can see the difference between the two. And the reason for that is, is because you're losing efficiency by processing multiple blocks. So now all of a sudden your processing time's doubled, your editing time's doubled, your QAQC is more than doubled, your deliverables are more than doubled. Um, so now we've gone from around 46 hours to 72 hours. And, and the reason that it's going up is because you are doing overlapping images. You're processing more data than you were had you been doing a single block. Your editing goes up for the same reason, but also the way that you edit your multiple blocks is affected in this scenario because now you have to, instead of mosaicing one large entire project, now you're creating individual mosaics bringing those back together and doing seam line editing all over again. So, you know, again, you, you've just added more work to the process. So cost variations as projects become larger. And we kind of talked about that a little bit. One complete project is always better than having to do subsets. Uh, subsets affect efficiency through redundancy. Again, 20,000 images as opposed to 15,000 images, and it's covering the same area. So it's just more work, more crunch time, more work. Subsets create additional editing. Uh, again, in your in your seam line editing and your tonal balances, sub subsets definitely affect quality because if tile one of your project was flown at you know 9 a.m. and tile 10 was flown at 4 p.m., 
Well, you've got a lot of different atmospheric conditions going on there. And because the project was broken up into, say, 10 tiles, the ability to mosaic those and match them well into a color balanced, cohesive product uh, becomes challenged. So something to consider. And then all of these, again, have an ex exponential impact on cost. The more tiles you have to do, the more subsets you have to create because your software can't handle uh, a large number of images, the more those costs are going to go up. Looking at this example, we can apply some rates to our personnel. So we'll use $85 an hour for a technician, $150 an hour for a professional, and $150 an hour for a two-man crew. Now, these rates may not be your rates. Um, you know, this is just arbitrary, but we can now look at what it takes to process one block represented in the first two columns next to rate under Correlator 3D, again, because we do not have to break up our projects in Correlator 3D to complete them, whereas we have it listed under Other, but it is the two columns to the most right, which represents projects that are broken up. In this case, in the example, it was 10 different tile sets. And this is just an example, you know, what we've seen where you look at, you know, along the bottom, a block of images. So, you know, 2,000 images, 5,000, 10,000, and 15,000, you could see cost starts to go up. Now, actual dollar amount, that, that's completely a variable because that depends on, you know, your business, your overhead rate, you know, what your fee is and all of that. But this, this is just an example to show that, as you do this, these costs start to become exponential. So we have some workflows in Correlated 3D to minimize the man hours that you're putting to these projects. We, we have an unlimited number of input images, um, and this reduces the need for subsets. There's, I mean, 50,000 images, 100,000 images, not a big deal. You can bring them all in, you can process them. Now you may want to, obviously, after processing, after AT, of course you're going to want to tile them up because you have to deliver them to a client in a, in a reasonable size that they can deal with. But, um, but you don't have to do that to get through processing with Correlated 3D. Scripting to ease efficiency. And then LiDAR import capabilities to aid in processing. So again, unlimited number of input images reducing the need for subsets. So you can see on the left, we have our 14,000, almost 15,000 images. You can see on the right, we have those same images, but they've had to be broken up into blocks and processed individually. And in doing so, with all that overlap, you've now created an overall project size of 20,000 images versus 15,000 images. Scripting to increase in efficiency. So Correlator 3D can be um, run via Python script. It can be run via command line. So if, if you know what you're doing and your projects are similar, then you can create scripts that will repeat the process. All you need to do is point it to a different folder. It'll grab those images and it'll work, uh, work its magic in, say, for example, that scenario. So um, we do have scripting capabilities, which make things move quite a bit faster. LiDAR import capabilities. So if, if you think about the workflow, we have um, image import. We have aerial triangulation, then we create the DSM. We may have to create a DTM. Then we go to the ortho process, and then finally the mosaic process. DSM DTM creation is probably the biggest chunk of processing time for any, any image-based processing software. LiDAR import capabilities will speed up your processing. And then finally, we also have the ability to use multiple PCs and accelerate the processing through distributed processing. And what we typically see with two PCs, we've almost doubled our processing speed. Three PCs, triple, four PCs, almost 5x. That's some pretty powerful processing speed. And again, Correlator 3D is GPU based, so the, the machines themselves don't have to be uh, intensive workstations. As long as the graphics card is good, um, you can use that. In, an, in our distributed processing 
workflow, you can assign portions of the processing tasks to different PCs as long as they're available to you within the network and connected to each other. So um, that is a huge time saver when you start talking about hundreds of thousands of images. So again, for my guests and myself, we thank you for joining us for this webinar. If you have any questions that we did not get to, we will answer those as soon as possible. And I'd like to again thank you for attending. This webinar will be converted to a podcast. That podcast will be available online in the next few weeks. Thank you very much for attending.